Welcome back to Math 11a. Today is the first day where we're going to be doing derivatives by rules, and lots and lots and lots of rules. So we'll see the addition subtraction rules, scalar multiple rules, those we've seen a little bit before. We're also going to look at the derivatives of the exponential function, e to the x, sine and cosine, products, and quotients. So that's, um, oh, and the power rule too. So that's a lot of rules, uh, and the way to learn these things is to practice them, and also to uh, look at examples that work and also how rules can be misused so that you don't fall into some common traps. Uh, so here we go. It's going to be kind of a, a, a fire hose of uh, derivative rules, but I hope that this kind of gives you something that you can kind of come back to, uh, rewatch the videos when you aren't quite sure how to use the rules. Um, so you can watch, fast forward, come back later, and eventually become very proficient at computing derivatives. Here we go. So we're going to start by looking at the derivatives of three functions that are common, the function e to the x, the function sine of x, and the function cosine of x. And we're going to start today with e to the x. I've drawn its graph here, y equals e to the x. It's an exponential growth graph. It has a landmark point right here at 0, 1, because e to the 0 power, like just about anything raised to the 0 power, is equal to 1. This is a landmark point, and uh, this number e, it's about 2.7 or so, and what it's cooked up to do is it's cooked up to make the slope here equal to 1. If you looked at y equals 2 to the x, it would be a little shallower, and the slope at this point would be less than 1. If you looked at y equals 3 to the x, it would be a little steeper, and the slope would be greater than 1. And e is that kind of magic number that you can put in the base, which makes that slope uh, right at this point equal to 1. That's one way to actually define the number e. It's that magic number that makes the slope equal to 1. If we look at the derivative, then in fact we already know the derivative when x equals 0, because the slope is 1. The slope of this tangent line is equal to 1. That's sort of how e is invented. And therefore, in the derivative, we'll plot the derivative down here, I see the same landmark point, 0, 1. If f of x equals e to the x, f prime of x, whose graph we're plotting here, passes through the same point here, because f prime of 0 equals 1, because this slope is 1. Now, if we trace this through, the slope over here is pretty flat. It's positive, it's definitely uphill, but it's pretty flat. The slope becomes 1 here, and then the slope becomes pretty steep by the time we get up here. And it looks like the slope is rising and rising, which is, notice the same thing that this is going with the actual values on the graph. So at this point, we're not only higher on the graph, the slope is also higher, which suggests in, in here, the value the actual location of the graph is pretty close to zero, and the slope is pretty close to zero. For most functions, these have nothing to do with each other, but for the function e to the x, when the value is close to zero, the slope is actually closer to zero. And when the value gets higher, the slope is actually higher. So you might expect then that the graph of the function looks a lot like the graph of its derivative. So this is the graph of the derivative, whatever this derivative is. And now I want to convince you that, in fact, the derivative is equal to e to the x. e to the x is not quite, but almost, the only function which is equal to its own derivative. If the function is e to the x, the derivative is e to the x. Now, why is this true? Well. Let me uh, convince you of something first. I want to give a little kind of explanation for why the derivative is actually equal to the function in this case. It all starts at this magic point where the slope is 1. Since the derivative at 0 is equal to 1, well, the derivative is something about a limit. The limit as h approaches 0 of f of 0 plus h 
minus f of 0 divided by h is equal to 1. That's what it means for the derivative to be 0 when x is equal to 0. So when the derivative is equal to 1 when x equals 0. And if we decode this, the function is e to the x. So the limit as h approaches 0 of e to the 0 plus h minus e to the 0 over h is equal to 1. And so the limit as h approaches 0, well, e to the 0 plus h is just e to the h. e to the 0 is just 1. So the limit as h approaches 0 of e to the h minus 1 divided by h is equal to 1. Okay, now this is just a useful fact. It doesn't tell us this yet. But let's kind of save this fact for later. This is what mathematicians would call a lemma. This is just kind of a nice, useful thing we, we just verified. We converted this slope statement into a statement about limits. And now if we want to compute the slope at some other point, if we look at f prime of x for a general x, this is the limit as h approaches 0 of f of x plus h, which is e to the x plus h, minus f of x, which is e to the x, divided by h. And that's equal to the limit as h approaches 0. We can divide this up. e to the, uh, e to the sum is the product of the e to things. So this is e to the x, e to the h, minus e to the x, divided by h. And this is equal to the limit. As h approaches 0, I can factor out an e to the x. And I have e to the h minus 1 on top, divided by h. Now, a little miracle occurs, which is that I've got this wonderful fact about the limit of e to the h minus 1 over h. This approaches 1 as h approaches 0. Down here, I've got the same thing right here. This stuff in green approaches 1 as h approaches 0. And 1 times e to the x is e to the x. And so I find, in the end, just e to the x. Because this green stuff is the same as this green stuff here. And this thing approaches 1, so this approaches 1, so I'm left with just e to the x. So that's uh, what mathematicians would call a proof of the fact that if the function is e to the x, the derivative is also e to the x. And the idea is kind of cool. The idea is that it's true at this critical point here, when x is 0, and then we can use laws of exponents to prove that it's true everywhere else. That's the idea. And this is one to memorize just that the if a function is given by e to the x, its derivative is also e to the x. It comes up over and over and over again. We're going to use it lots. The next one I want to look at is the function sine of x. We'll figure out its derivative. So let's do this qualitatively first, just to kind of remind ourselves what it means. The graph of sine of x, it looks something like this. So it goes up through the origin. It levels off. And it goes down and back up again. And it looks kind of the same over here. It goes down, back up, and it has this nice repeating pattern. And if we just kind of eyeball things a little bit, we can try to draw a tangent line or figure out, it's kind of weird to call it a tangent line because it crosses through here. But we can draw a line of the appropriate slope through the origin and this looks like it's about slope 1. And in fact, that's true. The slope of this line is 1. In other words, if you stand right here, your arms will be at about a 45 degree angle upwards. And so the derivative, if this is the function sine of x, then the derivative at 0, when x is 0, the derivative is 1. The derivative is given by the slope of the original function. And the other useful landmarks are the peaks and valleys. 
Because remember, if you stand at a valley, the slope is zero, and the same thing if you stand at a, at a peak. Those are places where the slope is zero. So down here, you'll see a zero in the derivative, and up here, that'll correspond to a zero in the derivative. The y location in the derivative is the slope of the original function. And if you look over here, it looks a lot like it is over here, just going downhill instead of uphill. So here, it looks like I'm down here. Now you might guess, okay, this is some sort of like triangular thing, but in fact, it's smoother than that. It looks uh, very much like the sine wave itself. It gently goes up, reaches a peak, goes back down, etc. And in fact, this graph might look familiar. It looks a lot like a sine wave, but it's kind of horizontally shifted, if you like. This is the cosine function. The derivative of the sine function is the cosine function. So the derivative of sine is cosine. Uh, and in fact, the derivative of cosine is not quite the sine function, it's the negative of the sine function. Notice here in the cosine, if I wanted to figure out the derivative of this function, I'm downhill here, so the slope is negative, but the sine is positive. Anyways, that's maybe a, a side fact. Uh, let me give a proof that the derivative of sine of sine of x is the cosine of x. So this I've kind of sketched what it looks like, done it qualitatively. Let me give you kind of a limit-based proof. Uh, this is, for those of you who remember your trigonometry and things, uh, it's, not essentially the, that it's not essential that you uh, remember this proof, but I'd feel kind of negligent if I didn't give it. So if we want to really figure out the derivative of sine of x, we use the limit definition. So f prime of x, well, if our function is the sine of x, then its derivative, f prime of x, is the limit as h goes to 0 of sine of x plus h minus sine of x divided by h. And now we can use something called the addition formula for, for angles. This really goes back to the Greeks as well, in a way. Uh, this is equal to the limit as h goes to 0 of sine of x cosine of h plus cosine of x sine of h minus, oh no, minus sine of x all over h. That's pretty horrible. Okay, now what do we do with this terrible mess? Well, we're looking at what happens when h goes to zero. So uh, what happens, this is the limit as h goes to zero of two things. First, I can factor out a sine of x from this term and this term, and I get sine of x times cosine of h minus 1, all divided by h. And then this other part of the limit is a cosine of x times sine of h over h. Okay, now I've got to do a little bit more work. So let me fill this in, give myself some room. I told you this was going to be a hard one, or maybe I didn't, uh, but I told you you don't really need to know it. So how are we going to figure out this limit? Well, it kind of has two pieces. So the limit 
as h approaches 0, of cosine of x times the sine of h over h. This has a limit that we've actually seen before. Sine of h over h. As h approaches 0, sine of h over h approaches 1. So this is, in fact, is just cosine of x. You have to keep track of what variables involved in the limit and what's not. Here, x is not really moving around, but h is approaching 0. And as h approaches 0, sine of h over h approaches 1. So that's just cosine of x. Now what about the other part? So that's kind of a good sign. The other part of the limit is this mess, sine of x times the cosine of h minus 1, all divided by h. Now, for this thing, we have to figure out what happens to cosine of h minus 1 divided by h as h approaches 0. Okay, how am I going to figure this one out? I've broken up my derivative into two parts. The first part simplifies to cosine of x. The second part, I got a little bit stuck for a second, so I had to remind myself how it goes. I'm going to use a Pythagorean identity, but first I'm going to do a difference of squares trick, which we've seen in a couple other contexts. So I'm going to take this fraction and multiply both top and bottom by cosine of h plus 1. This is the limit as h approaches 0 of sine of x times cosine of h minus 1 over h times cosine of h plus 1 over cosine of h plus 1. Then I have like an a minus b times an a plus b on top. I can express that as a difference of squares. And I find the limit as h approaches 0 of sine of x. And then if I multiply this out, I get cosine of h quantity squared, which is called cosine squared of h, minus 1 squared, divided by h times the cosine of h plus 1. Now, cosine squared of h minus 1, uh, that actually happens to be the same as the negative sine squared of h. So that becomes the limit as h goes to 0 of sine of x times negative sine of h squared, which is called sine squared of h, over h times the cosine of h plus 1. And this I'll expand out a little bit more before I actually compute everything. This is the sine of x. And negative sine squared of h, I'll write as negative sine of h. And I'll kind of multiply fractions, divided by h, times, so this is a multiplication, times sine of h over cosine of h plus 1. Now let's see where everything is going when h travels to 0. When h travels to 0, sine of x just stays sine of x. When h travels to 0, sine of h over h approaches 1. So this approaches negative 1. This is something that I used up there as well. When h approaches 0, sine of h divided by h is negative 1. And here, when h approaches 0, cosine of h approaches 1. So cosine of h plus 1 approaches 2. h approaches 0. And so this term approaches 0 divided by 2. Top approaches 0. Bottom approaches 2. And so therefore, the limit is equal to something times something times 0, which in fact is 0. Okay, all that work to show that something is zero. But in the end, this limit is composed of two terms, the sum of two terms. The first term is cosine of x, the second term is zero, term is zero, and so the limit is equal to cosine of x. That's the derivative of sine of x.
that's the complete proof. Um, there are some other kind of geometric arguments, but I just wanted to show you what the proof looks like. These are not things that I expect you guys to be able to come up with. Uh, it took some mathematicians many, many years to kind of figure these things out. Uh, this is why calculus is sort of a great achievement in mathematics, because people took the time, um, probably got stuck for months or years, that's what mathematicians do, until they figured out the right combination of tricks and techniques to actually figure this sort of thing out. And thanks to all those people, now all of you, as calculus students, can just use the fact that the derivative of sine of x is cosine of x um, without worrying so much about y. Uh, but if you're interested in mathematics, I think it's good to see these kind of why um, explanations to understand why things actually work. So let's see where we're at now. Where we're at, I think, is we have a few different functions for which we know the derivative. So one example is if we look at the function, say, x squared, we know the derivative is 2x. This is one that we figured out. Another example is if we look at a linear function, some function that describes a line of slope m and y-intercept b. Well, the derivative we know is the slope, and the slope here does not depend on x at all. The slope is just m. So, for example, if we take a function like 3x plus 17, the derivative will be 3, because the slope of the line is always 3. The derivative of x squared is 2x. It depends on x because the slope of a parabola depends on the x-coordinate where we're looking. Now, what else have we found? Well, I gave a justification using Yang Hui's triangle that the derivative of the function x to the n is actually the function x times n to the x to the n minus first power. A special case of that is when n is 2, and we have 2 times x to the first, or 2x. This is when n is a whole number. Now, what I've done so far today is I've looked at the function e to the x, which has this magic property that it's actually equal to its own derivative, sine of x, where I gave a long kind of trig in algebra, very difficult proof that the derivative of the sine of x is actually a cosine of x. And there's one more that is kind of like sine, the cosine of x. Its derivative is negative sine of x. Don't forget the negative here. That's just kind of a classic calculus mistake to make. The derivative of sine is cosine. The derivative of cosine is negative sine. There's one other... Uh, example that's related to x to the n. In fact, if I look at any power of x, the derivative is r x to the r minus 1. This is true whenever r is any real number. So, for example, if we look at x to the 1 half, that's the square root of x, right? The derivative is 1 half x to the 1 half minus 1, which is negative a half. And something raised to the negative a half power is the reciprocal from the negative of the square root from the 1 half. So this ends up being 1 over 2 root x. This is an example of the rule above. So there's a lot of things in this list, and you should be able to figure out all these derivatives from practicing these rules over and over again, there's not quite as many as it might look like, because really the distinct rules are this one, this one, this one, and this one. All the others are consequences of those four and things of like addition and scaling, which we'll see soon. So these are, this is a table of functions and the derivatives. Uh, these are some rules that you should know really well so that you can do derivatives quickly on paper. Now, we can put these together using the fact that sums and differences um, behave well. Let me just write it that way. 
for derivatives. What I mean is that if you look at f of x plus g of x, a sum of two functions, and you want to take kind of the derivative of the whole thing, that's equal to the derivative of the first plus the derivative of the second. And the same thing is true with subtraction. So for example, if I have, say, a sum of two functions on this list, like e to the x plus cosine of x, then f prime of x, I take the derivative of the first function, which is e to the x, and I add the derivative of the second function, which is negative sine of x. So that's minus sine of x. Or if I take a difference of functions, if f of x is maybe um, the square root of x minus sine of x, then its derivative is equal to the derivative of the square root of x, which is 1 over 2 root x. That's one way of writing it. The derivative of a sine is cosine. So the minus stays there, and I get cosine of x. Notice I've used the symbol f here and f here. What I mean in this rule, this addition and subtraction rule, is that if I take the sum or difference of any two functions, the derivative is the sum or difference of the derivatives of the functions. And here I'm just looking at an example like the sum of the functions e to the x and cosine of x. Here I'm looking at the example of the difference of the functions, the square root of x minus the sine of x. So besides sums and differences, derivatives also behave nicely when it comes to scaling functions. So what I mean by this is that if we take a function f of x and we multiply it by some constant and we take the derivative of that, the result is the same as taking the derivative of the function and scaling it by the same constant. So for example, if we look at the function, say, 7x squared, then this is the scalar 7 times the function x squared, or it's the function x squared scaled by 7. And so its derivative is equal to that same constant times the derivative of x squared, which is 2x. And so the result is 14x. Another example, if f of x is equal to, say, uh, let's do 3 sine of x, then f prime of x is equal to 3, that scaling factor, times the derivative of sine of x, which is cosine of x. Remember that this is only for scaling. So for example, if I have something like f of x is equal to 3 plus sine of x, then f prime of x, the derivative of the sum is the sum of the derivatives, and the derivative of a constant is 0. Maybe I should have put constants in here too. If we have a constant, the derivative is 0. This is a constant, its derivative is 0, so the derivative is 0 plus cosine of x, which is just cosine of x. So make sure that you see the difference between scaling a function, which means multiplying it by some constant, and uh, shifting a function. This is a vertical shift where we've added a constant. On the graphs, a shift will just shift something upwards, which doesn't actually change the slopes. If you move a shape upwards, it doesn't change any of the slopes, it just changes their position. But if you scale a function, it stretches it in the y direction, and stretching changes the slopes. So next thing I want to do, you might want to write down, take a minute and write down this table just for reference. I want to take the whole kind of screen up and do some examples that are a little tricky, a little closer to what you'll see on the homework. 
we're going to figure out the derivative of four functions, the square root of 9x, the function x squared plus 1 times root x, the function e to the x minus 1, and the function pi squared x to the fifth. And pretty soon you're going to learn so many rules that you're going to want to use these rules on these functions even though we actually have everything we need already. Pretty soon you might see this and you might say to yourself, I want to use the chain rule. And you'll see this and you'll say to yourself, I want to use the product rule. But we don't need those fancier rules to actually do them. If we take the time to use some algebra first to kind of think about what this is and to re-express this algebraically. So the key here is that the square root of a product is the product of the square roots. So this function, it's written as the square root of 9x, but that's the same as the square root of 9 times the square root of x. And the square root of 9 is 3. So all I've done so far, I haven't answered a question about the derivative, but I've expressed this function in a different way as 3 times the square root of x. This is a scalar multiple of the function root x. And now I compute the derivative as that scalar, 3, times the derivative of root x, which you might write as 1 over 2 root x. So 3 over 2 root x is one way of writing this solution. Uh, some of you might prefer rational exponents. So 3 root x also can be written as 3 times x to the 1 half power. And so you could also write this as 3 times r times x to the r minus 1 using the power rule. And x to the 1 half minus 1 is x to the negative 1 half. And so you might write this as 3 halves x to the negative 1 half. Both of these are common ways of writing the same thing. x to the negative 1 half is 1 over the square root of x. And so it all came from, you know, when you see some question like, what is the derivative of something? Your first instinct is to compute the derivative first. But sometimes it's better to slow down and to rethink what the function is, re-expressed in some way, and then go for the derivative. So always look for some simplification before you just derive, derive, derive. Derive, by the way, means find the derivative. So that same thing is true here. Pretty soon we'll have a product rule, but we don't have that yet. So let's express this in a different way by multiplying this out. So this is equal to just distributing x squared times root x. And root x is the same as x to the 1 half plus 1 times root x, which is x to the 1 half. And now I'll use laws of exponents. x squared times x to the 1 half, that's equal to x to the 2 plus 1 half. And 2 to the 1 half, 2 plus 1 half is 5 halves. So little fractions here. 2 plus 1 half is equal to 4 halves plus 1 half, which is 5 halves. That's where that 5 halves came from. And here we have x to the 5 halves plus x to the 1 half. And now I'm ready to compute the derivative because this is just the sum of two functions, two powers. And I'm pretty good at figuring out derivatives of powers. f prime of x, then, is 5 halves. We bring the power down, x, and then we decrease that power by 1. 5 halves x to the 5 halves. Sorry, 5 halves minus 1. And then plus 1 half x to the 1 half minus 1. And now I'll do some fraction work again. 5 halves x. 5 halves minus 1 is 5 halves minus 2 halves, which is x to the 3 halves. And then 1 half x to the negative 1 half. You can express this using square roots if you like, but these kind of rational exponents also are just fine. So that's the answer for this one. Now for the next one, f of x is equal to e to the x minus 1. Pretty soon you might want to do a chain rule on this, and, and actually that's kind of a fine way of doing it too. But I want to convince you that we know how to figure out the derivative of this now if we use some laws of exponents first. 
because we know the derivative of e to the x. And in fact, if we use our laws of exponents to break this up, this is e to the x times e to the negative 1. Maybe I'll write this as e to the negative 1 times e to the x. The point is that e to the negative 1, this is a constant. A constant is something that doesn't depend on x at all. e to the negative 1 is some number like, I don't know, it's 0.4 or something. So this is a constant times e to the x. And so the derivative is that same constant, e to the negative 1, times the derivative of e to the x. And e to the x is its own derivative. So it's e to the negative 1 times e to the x, which is the function we started with. I could just put these back together if I like. Kind of looks good. To write this again as e to the x minus 1. This function is also its own derivative. Now the last one, maybe I went over this principle previously. Sometimes constants can look very complicated. Pi squared, we see this, we might want to use like a power rule or something because there's a power in there. But recognize the constant. Pi squared is a constant. It's just some number. It's pretty close to 10. So this is a constant times the function x to the fifth. So its derivative is that same constant, that same pi squared, times the derivative of x to the fifth, which is 5x to the fourth power comes down, then decreases by 1. And I usually like my 5s to come before my pi's, so I'd write this as 5 pi squared x to the fourth. So those are some realistic sort of derivatives that you might see. None of them require the fancier rules like the product rule and the chain rule, um, which I think I'll show you next time.